Good evening. It's good to be with you again. It's nice to hear the piano working. Last time I was here, the keyboard was down, I think. I wondered if it was because you played too many notes and it just threw it off, but uh, <laughs> it is nice to hear, hear the piano again. It's, um, my name is Ron Vandroost. If you don't know who I am, if you're visiting, it, I've been here a few times. It's good to be back. Uh, for a call to worship, if we could stand, and I will read from Psalm 34, the first three verses. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so for this building, this group of people that can gather as your children, your family. We thank you for the gift of music and the gift of your word. We thank you for minds that can hear and understand and think. And we pray that you would guide us with your spirit through our worship this evening and you would accept our praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll now sing hymn number 564, Just a Closer Walk, followed by a Wonderful Grace of Jesus.
it's a good rousing number to begin with. It keep, gets the blood flowing. Um, I'd like to now recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I've, I've heard it introduced, Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, now join together in 665, O Master, let me walk with thee. You know, songs have an ability to bring back memories. And every time I hear that song, I think of myself as a young child at Westwood Christian Reformed Church in Kalamazoo. And I don't know whether they sang that all the time at night, but I just remember going to night services as a young child with my parents singing that song. It brings back good memories. Let's bow now to God in prayer. I want to apologize too. I, I got the prayer guide at home and I don't have a printer, so I thought, well, when I get here, I'll just get it. And I couldn't find any here. So the, the prayer needs in the prayer guide, I apologize. I will not be naming names like I should. I'm sorry. But, uh, oh, well, there you go. Maybe uh, I can keep up with it. Thanks. It's good that there weren't any left. It's nice that you guys all take them, and, and I'm sure pray for them. But let's, let's pray to God. Father God, we come to you as children. We come knowing that you are in control and we rest in your hands. We're thankful that you've promised to care for us and guide us and lead us. Many times it seems that life is out of control and that you're missing. But Lord, we know that you are there that you're carrying us through the hard times and whatever comes our way is for our good. We trust you. Lord, as we look at the world around us, we're concerned. Concerned with war, concerned with people 
getting killed, people starving, just so much turmoil, so much that is against the world that you created, so much sin, so much wrong. We pray that you would use us as some tool of yours to bring your kingdom, to make things right. Lord, we, we know that you are in control, as out of control as things seem. We come to you in faith knowing that you do hear us, that you love us, and that you care for us. We pray that you would be with the injustice and the poverty, the health concerns, the disease, the wars. We pray that you would, as we say in the Apostles' Creed, that your kingdom would come soon. We thank you for the promise that it will be made right in the end. We thank you that you care for us. We thank you for the many blessings we have from your hand. Oftentimes we forget that what we have is a gift from you and we think it's something that we have done or we have earned or we have, through our, our wisdom and knowledge and hard work, have created. But we know that we have nothing but by you. Lord, we pray that your grace would continue on. We've oftentimes fallen short of your will. We've rebelled against you. We've sinned time and again. Lord, we thank you that your grace is there for us, that you are forgiving and caring and loving and work with us. And we pray that you would help us to grow and to be stronger, to be better children. We pray that you would give us a, a trust in you, that you would give us the confidence to step out in faith for you, that we could be your tools, your workmanship, your, your hands and feet to bring love to the world around us and to make right the sinful state that we see. Lord, we count on you as a God of miracles. We pray that you would work miracles in, in our midst, that we could see your healing hand in those that are, are uh, ill. We think of the people in this church that are, are struggling with cancer and uh, heart problems and many other health problems. We pray that uh, you'd be with less Linema and, and his cancer, that you would give him strength and that you would help the, the medicine to work. Pray that you would be with Joby Lammers and, and her cancer and the, the tough times the cancer does on her body and the, also the treatment and the tr tough things that it causes for her to go through. We give her strength. We pray that you'd be with uh, some of these names I don't know that well, but Dale Lemmer and Janine Vanderkam, Christy Watson, Doris Shineman, Shinema. Lord, there are so many that are struggling. Most importantly, we pray that you would give them strength, that you would give them confidence in you, that you would also show us how to help, how to encourage, how to build up. And Lord, we pray too for miracles that you would heal. Lord, we, we rely on medicine a lot, but we know that really more than the medicine, it's your hand that heals those that are sick. And we pray that you would work in their bodies, work in their, their lives, that you would create cures. We pray that you would show yourself strong in this church, that you would use it and its ministries to reach out to the community, to the world, as it supports missionaries, as it supports local programs. We pray that you would really use East Martin Christian Reformed as a tool for building your kingdom. 
and that you would also give everyone here a drive to serve you, a willingness to step out in faith and to be used by you. We pray that you would show yourself strong here. Lord, in our text today, we we see that Israel assimilated to the culture around them, and we pray that you would help us as a church to avoid that same plight. Help us not to be sucked in by TV and books and other avenues that just present the world's views and, and makes light of sin. Help us to stand strong as your children and to be willing to face the wrong and call it out. We pray that you would help us to grow closer to you, that you would help us to grow stronger, that we could grow more and more as you would have us to be. Pray that you give strength to those who are struggling as illnesses and depression and financial stresses. We pray that you would be with the, the people suffering in health, that you'd give the doctors wisdom as they diagnose problems, that you would uh, provide finances for those that are struggling, that you would give support from us and from other people to encourage them and keep them from feeling low, and also that you would give them hope, hope that you are watching and in control and loving them. We pray that you would allow us to strengthen the members of this church, that you would work through us to be compassionate and build each other up, and that your Holy Spirit would be working in this midst, communicating needs, communicating ways of helping, and also teaching us. We pray that you would use us as mighty warriors in your kingdom, that we could lay all that we have before you and that you would take what we have and use it in a mighty way through miracles, through um, just the opportunities that face us to show your power to the world around us. We don't often understand what's going on around us, Father. We struggle. We pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us faith, and that you would give us trust, to trust in you through all that we face. Father, as we come forward for collection now, we pray that you would be with the cause that we are collecting it for, the Sun Life Camp. I'm sure that it's seeking to um, implant your word in children and that it's seeking to build them up and help them. And we pray that you would use these finances to continue that work. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. It will now be received. I'm sorry.
Thanks, Stan, for the sheet. I'm afraid I still missed. <laughs> it's hard to pray right off that, but thank you. I'm going to read for a text tonight from the book of Judges, Judges 6, verses 7 through 24. I think it's the first time I've ever preached from Judges, but it's a passage that I find very interesting. The Word of God. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt, from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites as if they were but one man. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went in, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a part, pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Ah, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and the place is called The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Oprah of the Abizrites. This is the word of the Lord. As I thought about this passage, I thought a good way to illustrate this message is with a story. So I want to tell you a story about D.L. Moody. I'm sure most of you have heard of D.L. Moody. This is just a very cursory story of his life, but I think it parallels Gideon in a way that makes it worth us looking at as we start this message. D.L. Moody was born in 1837 to a poor family. His mom was a Christian, but his dad was an alcoholic. 
And when he was four years old, his dad died, and they were just destitute. They lived in a small town in Massachusetts, and they struggled to get by. D.L. Moody dropped out of school at age 11 and just went to work to make ends meet. Then he really had a desire to gain wealth. That was kind of his mission in life. He wanted to get wealthy. So he went to Boston to look for riches, to get a good job. Well, he spent about a year there, and he never really landed anything decent. So he went to his uncle's place in Chicago, Illinois, and he started selling shoes. Now, his uncle, a wise man, said, I will hire you as a shoe salesman, but you need to get involved in a church here. So D.L. Moody wanted the job. He did it. And he worked hard at selling shoes. In D.L. Moody's church, there was a Sunday school teacher. Uh, I'm going to forget his name. Um, Shoot. Anyway, this Sunday school teacher had a desire to reach out to D.L. Moody, and he went to him at work. He was kind of afraid to go there, but he did. And he talked to D.L. Moody, and he said, I want you to help me teach the kids Sunday school. And D.L. Moody thought, well, I really can't do it, but, you know, I guess I know as much as the small kids. And so he started teaching Sunday school, and he went to the poor areas of Chicago and brought in hundreds of kids to this Sunday school, and it was a real success. And he really was very good at teaching Sunday school. But he thought, well, I can't do anything more than this because I don't know enough. I I just don't have the education, so I'm just going to stay with Sunday school. Then when he was about 30 years old, he went to England, and they had great big uh, gatherings, crusades in England. And in this crusade he went to, there was Spurgeon, and there was um, Mueller, and there was a guy named Henry Greinick, I think is his name. Uh, Henry Varley, excuse me. And he was listening to all this and really getting a lot out of these guys. They, they had thousands of people coming to hear him speak. Interestingly, Henry Varley also only had a fourth grade education. And people criticized him because he wasn't ordained to the ministry. And his comment was, God ordained me. And, and um, he had a real ministry. But he made this comment to D.L. Moody. The world has yet to see what God can do through a man totally committed to him. D.L. Moody heard that and he said, I want to be that man. He came back to the States and he continued with Sunday school. He got involved with the YMCA, built that up, and he started a church with all of these people that he ministered to. Now, Again, he had some trouble with this church because he did not have the education. He didn't have all of the knowledge, but he said, God is using me, and he did. He used to do a a mighty work in Chicago, a huge church, and he started having evangelistic campaigns, and he even started the school, Moody Bible Institute. You might have heard of it. It's still around today. But God used D.L. Moody in a mighty way And I think it really boiled down to his willingness to let God use him as he was. That, I think, is the whole lesson of our passage in Gideon. As we look at that, I want to divide it up a little bit. I want to look in our text at the situation that's present in this passage. Then I want to look at the man, the man Gideon, who he was, what he does, what makes him tick. Then I want to go to the message or the messenger and look at that. And then at the end, I hope to make some applications for us. So the situation. Israel was in a rough spot right now. Now, it's, you have to stop and look. It's 200 years since Joshua brought the people into the promised land. And they were given the command to kick out all of the people of that land, to kill them, destroy them completely. And Israel now is living among many of these people, disobeying God's directive. Gideon is the fifth judge. There was Ehud, I'm sorry, Othniel, Ehud, Shangar, Deborah, Barak, and then Gideon. 
And every time these judges came, they would kind of bring Israel back to God, then they would die, and what would happen to Israel? They would fall away again. Another judge would come. It was just this up and down thing. It was a mess. As I look at what things were like in Gideon's Israel, I think it was really bad. And, and probably none of you will get this illustration, but I'm going to give it anyway. I raised eight kids, and there were times where I had to watch cartoons. <laughs> and one of the shows that the kids really liked was ants. And these ants would store up food. They worked hard, and they got all these stores of food, and then the locusts would come in and take all their food, and then the ants would have nothing for the winter, and many of them would die. But it, I think that is exactly what was happening in Israel right here. The people of Israel would grow crops. They would strive to make ends meet, and these Midianites would come from the desert on camels. And where where Israel was here, it was right in a big valley called the Jezreel Valley, and they would come through with their camels and just rip the nation apart, taking everything they could carry and then leave. Now, they didn't kill the people because they wanted the people to grow more stuff for the next year, and they would come again. And year after year, these Midianites were just beating them up, and they were just beyond hope at this time. Finally, at the beginning of our text, we read that the Israelites cried to God. And I think that was the whole purpose that God sent these Midianites. He sent them to draw the people to him. Now it's interesting, this prophet comes in our text and he has really a good message to the people, but I never see what the people's response to his message was. It jumps right from the prophet's proclamation to Gideon and the angel of the Lord. But anyway, that gives you an idea of what it was like. Gideon was so beaten down, he was threshing grain in a wine press. Now, if you know anything, some of you guys are farmers, so you've dealt with wheat, but when you thresh grain, when you work with wheat, you have to get the chaff away from the wheat. And they used to, in Israel, they would have oxen grind the wheat down and then they would be on a hill and they'd throw it up and the wind would just whip all the chaff away. The problem is, if the Israelites did that, the Midianites would see them and come take the grain as soon as they got it. So Gideon, being the brave man he was, crawled in a hole, a wine press, and did his work in there and was able to salvage some of his crop that way. That's the situation we see in our text as it comes about. Um, I want to make sure I've got all of these points. Um, one other point I had here, and, and I, I just, God gave me this vision as I was studying this, but I thought, I wanted to talk about can people change? And I think Israel did not seem to change. They were stiff-necked people. They just fell back into sin over and over again. And I got to thinking, can we change? And, and I thought about my classmates from high school. And I bumped into a few of them in the past couple months, and I thought, you know, I don't think they really change. Do, we, do any of us change? Are we always the same? I, I, I see some of these guys in the very same things that they acted like when they were in high school, they act like now, and I think, what hope is there for us? Now, Gideon shows the hope for change for the people of Israel, and I think the real important thing here is that the important thing for us is Jesus Christ is the only way change can happen for us. We cannot pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and change. Only God can change us. And I thought of this scripture, um, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But change was needed in Israel, and God was the way to get that change. That's the situation. It was a bad situation, pretty much hopeless. But the beauty of it is, excuse me, in the first part of our text, I think of Psalm 34, 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fear. Israel sought the Lord, and he heard them. 
And God is gracious. Even though Gideon was the fifth one to come along, God was gracious and said, let's do this again. You cried to me, I hear you, and I'm coming to help. That's the situation. But now let's look at the man Gideon. Um, There's a lot of names in this passage, and it's kind of interesting to look back at these names. The name Gideon, this is interesting, it means feller, hewer, or great warrior. It's interesting that Gideon is felling wheat, hewing wheat, and the angel comes and calls him a great warrior. But I have to think, was the angel kind of talking tongue-in-cheek here? I mean, Gideon was hiding in a wine press. He wasn't doing any war. He was trying to stay away from war. He was, he was a coward, really. And the angel called him great warrior. And I don't know if that's kind of relating back to his name or if it was a prophetic announcement that Gideon was going to be a great warrior and God saw it. But anyway, that's the man Gideon, great warrior. Um, The other thing I think is important to see with Gideon is he was humble. As I look through all of Scripture, it seems like the people that God uses are always humble people. People who don't think that they can do it themselves, God shows himself strong in their behalf. Um, In our text, it talks about, I am the least in my family. I'm in the least tribe of Judah. I'm nobody. Why are you coming to me to save the people? I'm not the one. He was humble about it. I think that's important. I think God looks for our humility. Because it isn't Gideon's strength that did anything in this passage, in this whole book. It's God's strength through a humble man. The other thing I see about Gideon, which I I struggled with quite a bit, is Gideon questioned God. I think, is that right? Is that right? You know, God, how can you say you've got control of the situation? Look at the situation. It's rotten. Um, Let's see where it is in our text. Uh, But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are the wonders our fathers told us about? And you think, whoa, is God going to be mad at him? I think, no. No, it's okay to ask God questions. Job did. And God wasn't angry at Job for asking the questions. I think it's the searching mind, the desire to know God's answer that's important. It's okay to ask questions. I, uh, I think back when I was in high school, there was a, a member at, at Westwood CRC who was very famous for raising peonies. He had uh, um, breeds named after him and everything else. But um, he came out one time and he said, I'm mad at God. He brought a frost and it killed my prized peonies. And I thought, well, you can't say that. But... He was being honest with God. He was angry that that happened. Now, he was willing to accept what God did, but I think it's okay, I think, to question God, to talk honestly to God. But listen, listen to God and hear what he's saying. Be willing to understand that God knows best. He's in control. But anyway, we see that with Gideon here. He questioned God. I think another important thing to look at here is the way that God showed himself to Gideon. As I look through scripture, God comes to people in all kinds of different ways. And I think we often think, well, if God's going to come to me, he's going to come to me in a still small voice in a cave like he did Elijah. No. Well, you might say, well, he's going to come to me in a burning bush like he did Moses. Or he's going to come to me on the road like he did Saul and just, you know, bright flash of light. Or or think of how he came to Isaiah. He came to Isaiah. Isaiah was transported to heaven and saw the glory of God and was scared to death. But then you think of how did he reveal himself to Sarah? (laughs) On the other side of a tent flap. 
She didn't even come out to see God. And God said, Sarah, I hear you laugh. Don't laugh. I'm coming. I'm going to bring a child to you in your old age. But God revealed himself differently to many people. And I think we need to look at this and say, God can't be put in a box, but God can reveal himself to all of us. That's a lesson to learn from Gideon. The other thing I think is important to look at here is qualifications. Probably one of the key phrases for me in this whole text is God is telling Gideon, let's see what verse it is. Um, The Lord turned to Gideon and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? Um, How was Gideon qualified? Was it because he had a lot of war training? No. How was he qualified? He was qualified because God qualified him. There's a quote I read in one of the commentaries that says, um, let's see if I want to get this right. It's just a little tricky. Um, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I think that's an important thing for us to learn from Gideon. How many of you say, I'm not qualified to do this work for God? That's okay. In fact, it's okay that you're humble and say that, but God can qualify you. Just as he qualified D.L. Moody to do great work, it wasn't because D.L. Moody was qualified because of his great education. He was qualified because he was willing to be used by God. I think of the, uh, the little kid that had... Uh, I'm going to say this wrong. Five loaves and two fishes in Jesus' day. Was he qualified to feed 5,000 people? No. But what did he do? He gave what he had, and God qualified him by using that gift to feed a multitude. And the same is true for all of us. Are we qualified? doesn't matter. If God qualifies you, that's the important thing. Think of the disciples. Were they qualified? Think about it once. The man Peter, he was a hothead. He was always blowing off his temper and and saying things without thinking. Think of um, James and John. What was their name? Sons of Thunder. How do you think they got that name? I'm guessing that they were a little rowdy, that they were troublemakers. Um, Thomas. Thomas, we think of as the doubter. Philip is kind of interesting. If you, about the only thing you hear about him in John 14, 8, you get the idea that he really wasn't the brightest crayon in the box. He wasn't really qualified to be a disciple. Simon the zealot. Zealot meant that he was kind of in a gang, a gang fighting against Rome, but he was a gang member. Um, Matthew. Matthew sold himself out to the Romans. The Jews hated those guys, tax collectors. Was he qualified to be a disciple? But they were qualified by God. The one that was most qualified, interesting to know, Judas Iscariot. He was a real financier. He was a bright man. He was from Judah. He was a very religious, devout Jew. And look at how qualified he was in the end. So you think, yeah, Gideon was qualified by God. And we have to say, are we qualified by God? I think yes. In humility, if you look to God, if you consecrate yourself to him, the world has yet to see what God can do through you. What else do we have about Gideon? Oh, there's a good one. His offering. Think about this. This is time of famine in Israel. And Gideon has this representative before him, and he says, can you wait here a minute while I bring an offering for you? And he gets a kid goat and well, probably a little over half a bushel of grain, probably everything that he's just worked so hard to get. And he makes a meal for this messenger. Gideon probably placed his all on the altar. 
That's a big step of faith. What's his family going to eat next week? He just gave it all to this messenger. He committed himself in a big way to be a servant for this messenger. And I think that's important for all of us. Do we have that commitment? Have we stepped out in faith? I think of um, Israel when they were going into the land of Canaan. The, the Levites were carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders and it was flood season in Israel at that time. And they were commanded by Moses to step into the Jordan River. Now that was a step of faith. That river was probably raging at that time and it was a steep bank. So they had to kind of step down off a bank into the river and trust that God would care for them as they went across with that ark. And God dried up the river and created a pathway into the promised land. But it took a step of faith. Just as Gideon needed a step of faith, so all of us need a step of faith. God calls us to commit ourselves, to commit that offering to him, to say, I'm willing, God, I'm consecrated to you. Take my life and let it be. It's a lesson we can learn from Gideon. There's a, a text in Second Chronicles. Um, Asa is uh, kind of displeasing God, but this is the answer that one of the prophets brought to him. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those who are fully committed to him. That's what God is looking for, to strengthen himself to us. And that was Gideon. Even his name said it. It's kind of interesting after Gideon, and, and I find this interesting, Gideon um, was asked by God to sacrifice, to break down the, the idol to Baal and Astra and make a sacrifice to God. And he managed to get 10 servants with him. He was still kind of chicken. He did it at night, but he did it. He took this step of faith and he knew it was going to be problems. And I find it interesting, the people gave him a name after that. Did you see that? They gave him the name, oh, I've got it written here. Um, oh, shoot. My notes aren't good enough. I, I could read it in the text. That's better yet. Um, oh, I guess it's in the, the, the section just after this. The, the people wanted to kill Gideon, and his dad talked him into letting Baal do the dirty work. If, if Baal's so powerful, let Baal kill him. And, and they gave Gideon a new name. It said, um, Baal is coming to get you, basically. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of an interesting thing, that, that uh, Gideon was willing to uh, step out again in faith in that way. Um, now let's uh, talk about the messenger. I think it's very important to start right out here and realize that the messenger had to have been a theophany. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but it means the Lord Jesus Christ appearing on earth before his incarnation. But if you ever look, anytime anybody wants to worship an angel, they just turn away like the plague. Don't worship me, I'm just a messenger. But in this case, the messenger accepted Gideon's offering, accepted his worship. And so this was Jesus, I believe, coming to Gideon to talk to him. And in verse 14, he says, go in the strength that you have, Gideon. I find that interesting. He's saying, Gideon, you got what you need. Go with the strength you have. It's God-given strength, and it will be enough. Take a first step. And then he says, I am sending you. I think that's an important point to make here in that messenger. Is God sending you? So many people today sit back and let somebody else do all the work. They let somebody else do it. I, I've done my time. I'm tired. I don't want to do it. It's too much work. But God is sending you. And are you willing 
Are you willing to take that step out in faith and be used by God? God, God could have beat the Midianites without Gideon. He didn't need Gideon. We've seen other places where angels have defeated whole armies. We've seen other places where God has sent hornets out to defeat enemies. But in this case, he chose to use Gideon. And it's kind of interesting. God wants to use consecrated people. He did it with Gideon. And I think the point here that I, we really need to see this is we, as Christians, come alive when we are doing kingdom work. Just like I said, D.L. Moody wanted to come to Chicago to get rich, and he gave up that drive for riches because he found reaching Sunday school kids was more rewarding than riches could ever be. That's true for us. We need to know that when we are working for God's kingdom, the rewards are there. The last point I want to make in this messenger is the whole idea of miracles. I think in our world today, we give up on miracles. We say, that was something in the Bible, they don't happen anymore. Um, when I was in, uh, in the lab, one of my coworkers, a Christian, read a book by Francis Collins called uh, uh, The Language of God, Creation versus Evolution. Now, Francis Collins, I don't know if you heard of him through this whole COVID thing, but he was Fauci's boss. But he was a Christian, or is a Christian. He spent a lot of time mapping the human genome. Very brilliant man. But I read his book, and the whole book was busy trying to explain miracles away. He could explain the existence of man without any miracle. Uh, he, he did it through evolution. He thought that was just fine. God could work through evolution. He didn't need miracles. And, and through that whole book, I thought, couldn't it have been a miracle? Couldn't God have created the world in seven days? Did it have to be billions of years old? Couldn't God have created Adam and Eve? Did he have to evolve through the genome pool or whatever? And I just got angry about it. He was so convinced that as a scientist, miracles couldn't exist. And I think we need to be as Gideon and say, yes, God can work miracles today. I've seen it. I've seen him do it. Miracles are real, and we can't doubt that. You look at Gideon. He had the miracle of the offering. Later on, he has this fleece that he puts down. There's a miracle there. And then we have the battle. He went out with 300 men. God whittled it down so it was just an infinitesimal number of soldiers to go against 135,000 enemy. And God plus that 300 men was more than enough. The miracles are real. I think that's an important point to get out of this messenger. I find it interesting as I, I look at Mary, Jesus' mother, when she came to Elizabeth, in Luke 145, Elizabeth made an interesting comment. She said, blessed are you, Mary, because you have believed. God created a miracle in Mary, a virgin birth. And Elizabeth said, you are blessed because you believe in miracles. But we need to believe in them too. We need to expect them. We not, not be surprised that God can work through us if we're willing, if we step out in faith and allow him to. Finally, application. What can we learn from Gideon? Are you ready to let God use you? Do you feel inadequate? Gideon did. If you do, good for you. That shows that you know that it isn't through your power that God is doing it. It's through his power, his qualifications. You plus God are enough to do anything. God doesn't need you, but he desires to use you. And you will come alive as you allow him to use you to build his kingdom. I think back to the opening illustration with D.L. Moody. Are you 
willing to be consecrated to God to see what he can do through you? I was listening, I had to listen to church on TV this morning because we were um, sitting with my mother-in-law. And interestingly, a pastor, I think, it, I can't even remember, David Jeremiah, I think, concluded his sermon with a D.L. Moody quote. And I thought, I'm going to use that. That's a good one. It was a miracle. <laughs> but anyway, um, some guy came up to D.L. Moody after he preached a stirring sermon. He had a slip of paper. He said, D.L. Moody, I have 18 references of bad grammar you used in your message today. D.L. Moody said, well, thank you. I'm sorry. I did the best I could. Are you? I thought, Wow. That's a good answer. I ask you the same question, are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you show us the foibles and shortcomings of Israel, of Gideon. We thank you that we can learn from them. We thank you for the challenges that you give us. We know you don't need us, but we thank you that you want us. We pray that you will qualify us, that you will change us, that you will show yourself strong through us. In Jesus' name, amen. For a closing hymn, I would like to turn to Have Thine Own Way, Lord, number 591. If you could stand. For benediction, I want to read from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.